The C-SPAN networks bring you long-form public affairs programming from the nation's capital and are a public service of your television provider. C-SPAN, created by cable. This week on The Communicators, an exit interview with the former chairman of the FCC, Julius Janikowski, and the top Republican, Robert McDowell, both of whom retired from the commission just recently. Also joining our conversation, Lynn Stanton of Telecommunications Reports. Chairman Janikowski, if I could start with you and uh, Commissioner McDowell, if you'd chime in as well. Recently on this program, former FCC official Blair Levin said that the spectrum auctions were not going to happen. They were going to push until 2015. What are your thoughts about the spectrum auctions and the timetable? Well, I think, are you referring to the incentive auctions, which um, uh, we're at a very interesting time. You know, four years ago, we had no plan as a country on how to free up a significant amount of spectrum in the 600 megahertz band. And in fact, we didn't really have a plan to hit the targets that we set out four years ago, 300 megahertz by 2015, 500 megahertz by 2020. And here we are today, the community is debating what the band plan should look like for 600 megahertz. So we developed an incentive auction idea, Congress passed it, the FCC is moving forward with it. Uh, I think the agency will hit the 300 megahertz target by 2015. Uh, hitting the 500 megahertz target by 2020 is going to take a lot of work, uh, but it's important that we do that, and we're moving faster than any other country in the world to free up spectrum for our mobile economy. Commissioner McDowell. So, to the specific point, by the way, thanks for having me back, and it's good to be here with my former colleague, and I guess current colleague for the for purposes <laughs> yeah, of the true. show. Um, so. Uh, it, it could conceivably start a little later. I've been uh, uh, a little concerned about that since the outset. These things take longer than expected sometimes. Uh, during my seven years on the commission, uh, I was there when we did the two other largest uh, spectrum auctions in history uh, in 06 and also uh, the 700 megahertz auction that started in December of 07. Um, and with the 700 megahertz auction, that was part of the digital television transition, folks might uh, remember. Um, that uh, we actually had industry coming to us at one point asking us to pause while they were still digesting that 06 uh, spectrum auction. So you don't know what sort of surprises there might be. Uh, right now the commission's down to three, three of our now former colleagues, um, and we're awaiting the other two to come on board. Uh, Washington has uh, a lot of things going on, uh, especially in Congress, uh, and uh, it could be a while before uh, both of those folks are in installed. So. There is a possibility it couldn't start until later. I'm hopeful it could start in 2014. I think it's important for it to do so. Um, and I do have a concern that the auction could be a little bit more complicated than it might need to be. So that policy debate needs to happen as well. So it's not like the new chairman is going to walk in on a Friday and they'll start having an auction on a Monday. There are a series of very complicated orders that need to go out. And as I've said many times before, but it's no exaggeration, this auction will be the most complex in world history. But the chairman, ex-chairman, is absolutely right <laughs> uh, in that uh, we are moving faster than the rest of the world and have all along. And so the eyes of the world, uh, at least in the wireless space, are looking at the U.S. to see how we handle this. And uh, I'm optimistic in the long run uh, that it will yield some spectrum, but uh, not as much uh, maybe as is needed. Well, do you both think that... Uh Acting Chairman Clyburn should move forward in, in case there's a delay in getting two new commissioners on board? You know, the, these incentive auctions are uh, an institutional responsibility of the FCC. There's a great team uh, up and running uh, at the agency uh, that's been working on this issue all along. We'll continue to work on it. Uh, each of the commissioners at the commission understands these issues. They're experienced with it. Uh, I, I think the commission will continue to move forward with each step. Rob is right. This is uh, the most complex auction spectrum recovery idea that we've devised. Now, we're also the country that devised auctions in the first place, that came up with unlicensed spectrum in the first place, and now we're the country that developed incentive auctions. Um, but I think the agency regards this as an institutional objective. It'll keep moving forward, uh, and I'm quite certain there'll be agreement that uh, the process should move forward uh, as fast as it can while doing what Rob says, which is making sure that we get, that the commission gets the hard, complex decisions right. I do want to say that it, it is a very important thing that we're seeing from the community real engagement in the substantive issues. People aren't debating whether or not to have 
an incentive auction. They're not debating whether or not to recover Spectrum. We're debating what the first uh, broadband era ban plan should look like. That's a hard question. The U.S. is going to be the first country in the world to figure it out. There are some tricky but important issues to address. Uh, you know, uh, in the old world, uh, uplinks and downlinks had symmetrical amounts of spectrum. That made sense in a voice world where, you know, when we talk to each other, it's about equal. Well, you know, in a broadband data world, um, uh, maybe that symmetry doesn't make sense because there's more data coming down than up. Or maybe it does. These are hard questions. Decisions will have to be made. Uh, and I, I, I think we'll see a focused uh, commission, staff and commissioners working on these issues steadily, uh, focused on getting the issues right and getting the auction uh, to move forward. You've both talked about the complexity of this particular auction. Um, could you talk a little bit about the specifics in terms both of design, what they need to do, what the your former colleagues need to do in terms of getting broadcasters to come in and return their spectrum and what um, substantively, what sort of decisions they should be making in terms of designing the auction um, and the band plans. You just mentioned the uplinks and downlinks. Should the commission be deciding that, or maybe should the carriers themselves be deciding what fits best with their it's a good. Plan? It's a good question, Rob. I'll go, you, you, um, let me answer it quickly, and then I know you, you, we've both been thinking a lot about this. Uh, your question gets to something important in the complexity of the overall thing, because it's not just the question of what the forward auction should look like, what the band plan should look like, what all of those auction rules should look like. There are all the new questions around what does the reverse auction for broadcasters look like. Now that's um, uh, a whole set of issues of first impression and uh, maximizing the number of broadcasters that participate is an important objective because that'll correlate to the amount of spectrum that gets freed up. Uh, and uh, boy, if we, if we uh, spent time on each of the complex issues that the commission will have to address in the period ahead, we'd, we'd be here for six hours or more. Let's do it. Uh, <laughs> um, but what I'm, uh, I think one of the things I suspect Rob and I agree on this, um, uh, there's a terrific uh, group, staff at the commission focused on facts and data, and we now see an industry that's focused on all the hard questions. Uh, it's what you want in this area, and out of it will come, I believe, um, uh, a set of uh, answers, I think correct answers, to the many difficult questions. I, you know, on the, on the point of uh, at what point uh, is it worth it for broadcasters to relinquish spectrum, I think that was mm -hmm. at the heart yeah. of your question. And, and so the, uh, the viewers need to understand that there's a reverse auction uh, as part of the statute that came out of Congress as to how cheaply will broadcasters give up their spectrum. Then there's a forward auction as to how expensively will the uh, well, the wireless companies uh, bid uh, for that spectrum. And then uh, the third big component is the repacking, which is uh, finding a neighborhood for the broadcasters and finding another neighborhood for uh, the wireless companies. And that's very complicated. Um, the way the notice of proposed rulemaking, the proposed ideas were to make uh, some of that simultaneous, there's a lot of game theory uh, going on there. Um, and you know, as I was leaving the commission, uh, before I left the commission, I talked to a lot of folks on both sides, bidders and sellers, and there was com some concern about the simultaneous nature of that. Uh, it was very reliant on software, redesigning the repacking and, and all the rest after each bidding round. Um, so what that all boils down to uh, for me is uh, if you make it simpler, it's probably going to work better. Uh, those are the lessons I learned from the AWS 1 auction and uh, the 700 megahertz auction. And that there are always unintended consequences, even if you keep it simple, but there are even more unintended consequences if you add complexities and try to over-engineer it. So, uh, you know, there's one uh, school of thought of just put the broadcasters, the, the buyers and the sellers in a room, and, you know, uh, then they come out and they, they can't do that under the statute. There's uh, antitrust and all sorts of price-fixing issues there. But something, you know, simple along those lines, uh, uh, virtually speaking, uh, could, could work. So... Um, you know, I'm, I'm concerned, as I've said before, about it, about it being too complex, and therefore uh, broadcasters not knowing what the right uh, price point might be. Um, so you want to make it uh, a rewarding experience for them to give them an incentive to give up as much spectrum as possible. And if there's more complexity to it, that will create more uncertainty and actually probably make it less likely that they would relinquish more spectrum. Uh, do you expect that... Uh what you heard as you were leaving, that this auction is going to raise enough money to meet all the needs that uh, Congress has put on it in terms of the public safety network and 
twenty billion or so in uh, paying down the the deficit and all those wonderful things. I my expectation is that the the uh, Money that has been targeted for public safety network and the other uh, specific um, uh, uh, initiatives like that, I'm very confident the auction will more than raise enough money for that. Uh, exactly how much above that I think is uncertain. It'll come down to questions uh, of auction design, level of broadcaster participation. One of the things to keep in mind with an auction like this is that the revenue that comes out of the auction is very important. But the benefits for our economy in terms of GDP growth, innovation, job creation, and ultimately uh, tax revenues are much broader than if you just measure the auction revenues. And that's been the record going back many years. It'll continue to be the case. Um, so I I'm convinced that we'll get uh, the revenue out of the auction to meet the <coughs> targets in the statute for public safety network and other items like that. Um, uh, and the focus on freeing up as much spectrum uh, as possible, uh, I think, is the right objective for the commission. Gentlemen, we asked uh, several reporters who covered telecommunications here in Washington if they had questions for you, and uh, we got several questions. And I want to start with this one from John Egerton of Broadcasting and Cable Multi-Channel News on net neutrality. Surprise, surprise. Um, if you had any, we'll start with the uh, former chairman, then we'll go to Commissioner McDowell. Uh, Chairman Janikowski, if you had stayed at the commission, uh, you were prepared to reclassify internet access under Title II if the C FCC lost the net neutrality case? Well, I think, uh, first of all, the FCC had a very good day at the Supreme Court uh, recently, uh, not only winning the tower siting case, that was an um, uh, initiative that we worked on uh, together, uh, but also on a basis that I think strength strengthens uh, the agency's uh, authority as appropriate given what the agency needs to do in the broadband era. So I was uh, confident about the open inter internet litigation before the recent Supreme Court decision. Uh, I remain, I'm even more confident now. And I would say, look, you know, um, uh, the uh, rules were adopted about three years ago. Um, uh, they've, the marketplace has shown that they're working. We've seen since the open internet rules went into effect, an increase in innovation and investment uh, across the broadband economy. There were people at the time who argued uh, if open internet rules were adopted, that would lead to a cessation in any investment in network infrastructure. Well, the opposite has happened. We're seeing an increase in investment in wired and wireless network infrastructure since then. Uh, we have a stable uh, framework now that's working. Uh, I'm concerned about the uncertainty that the litigation is creating. Uh, although I do think the recent Supreme Court decision will help the FCC uh, in the D.C. Circuit. Despite the fact that the FCC, uh, we agree on things about 90% of the time unanimously, this is, was one of those areas of very sharp disagreement. So, first of all, I, I don't think there was any market uh, problem to fix. Uh, second of all, I don't think the FCC has the statutory authority, and even after Monday's Supreme Court decision, uh, that didn't give uh, the FCC legislative authority. Uh, what that said was if there's a ambiguity in your jurisdiction, uh, maybe the expert agency gets some deference here. Um, in this case, there's no ambiguity over the jurisdiction. The, the language coming out of the Telecommunications Act of 1996 is all about taking away regulatory barriers, deregulating, and, and didn't, never spoke to open Internet and things of that nature. Um, so uh, I don't think it blows winds in the sale of uh, the FCC uh, order, which I voted against uh, on uh, net neutrality. Uh, if, uh, to ask, answer your question directly, though, I think it would be economically disastrous uh, if... Uh, the FCC moves to any classification of broadband internet access as a Title II service or monopoly phone service type regulation from 1934. There's no way to do that in a skinny fashion. Uh, that's like saying you're partially pregnant. And also it would really fuel this international effort to regulate the content operations and economics of the internet uh, at the International Telecommunication Union. Um, so I think even uh, some of the uh, non-telecom companies are understanding that now because they have thousands of miles of fiber linking servers and routers all over the world, and they offer voice, video, and data services. That could be Google, that could be AT&T, that could be Comcast, that could be Microsoft. Um, so uh, some of the internet companies that were pushing for such regulation, I think, are now realizing they're within an inch of being regulated as a telecom carrier themselves. So I, I would hope the next chairman uh, would scrap the Title II docket altogether. I think it's very disruptive. There wasn't uh, uncertainty before the open internet order of 2010. Mr. Jedikowski, any response to that? 
no, I don't think so. I think, look, I think the important thing is that we preserve in the United States and around, and around the world uh, a free and open Internet. Uh, uh, we've secured that in the U.S. Uh, Rob and I agree very strongly that the, some of the proposals we've seen internationally to create a new layer of, uh, inter of international regulation of the Internet are a big mistake. Um, uh, so even in this area, I think there are uh, some very significant areas of agreement. Um, with respect to the U.S. landscape, uh, again, I think there's a uh, strong and sensible framework in place. It's working in the U.S., and we should let it continue. Lynn Stan. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the changes in the delivery video programming, um, <coughs> certainly even in the short, relatively short time, less than a decade and just four years on your part, that you were at the FCC. Things have just changed incredibly um, in terms of over the Internet and, and also new facilities-based competitors like AT&T and Verizon and Google and then on the Internet, Netflix and uh, Aereo now. Um, what does that mean in terms of what the FCC should be doing when it looks at this industry? Uh, do you need to rationalize the approach of regulation to uh, providers that are very differently treated under the laws or, or the regulations? Well, I hoped you were going to uh, uh, ask um, uh, what we thought about Arrested Development coming on Netflix. Uh, that this too. Weekend, I'd, which I'd which, uh, love to hear which about I'm that. personally very excited about. <laughs> House of Cards uh, uh, on Netflix was a, uh, an important moment. And it says something about um, uh, the exciting things that we can see when new channels are, uh, are opened up. Uh, so we're in a landscape that's absolutely shifting. And, uh, uh, and there are areas of the statutory scheme uh, where it would make sense to look at and say, are those keeping up with uh, the changes in the marketplace? Uh, fundamentally, uh, uh, having this kind of competition, programming innovation, uh, access by new players to consumers, uh, and access by the traditional players uh, to viewers in new ways. Obviously, what's happening uh, on tablets is amazing. What's starting to happen in the living room is very exciting. Um, uh, we're in uh, just an incredible time when it comes to the delivery of video programming to consumers. There are issues. Uh, uh, we uh, heard it at the commission, both of us did, from uh, distributors who are co uh, concerned about the, the cost of programming. Consumers are concerned about the cost of programming. Uh, so that's an issue that I think the Commission and Congress will need to continue to look at. Um, but I do think this is an area where the glass is, uh, uh, is, uh, is half full at least because we're seeing exciting new competition uh, uh, and creativity uh, in, this, uh, in this part of the landscape. To use this analogy a little bit more, I would actually say the glass is overflowing and runneth <laughs> over. Uh, I think it's a terrific time to be a consumer in the video market and the audio market too. And uh, probably like uh, the ex-chairman, I look uh, at this market through the eyes of my kids um, I have three young kids, and uh, what are their consumption habits here? And they have more choices than any you know, human beings in, in history in terms of what's there, and through more conduits, too. Uh, so I think it's a, a very positive, constructive, and disruptive marketplace right now, and I think the law needs to be revised uh, to reflect that. The FCC has really zero authority to forbear from regulation in the video uh, uh, realm, uh, and I think Congress uh, needs to help us out with that, but to... Uh, or help the FCC out. <laughs> I mean, that slip has only been a week. But, uh, uh, but also in all, all areas. So we have these stovepipes of if you're offering uh, services over twisted copper pair, there's one set of rules. If it's over coaxial cable, there's another set of rules. If it's over the air one way, yet another. Over the air, another way, yet another. Uh, <coughs> and uh, the marketplace has converged uh, well beyond that. Uh, these are 80-year-old concepts, and we need to move on, but Congress really needs to initiate a rewrite as soon as possible. Gentlemen, I'll start with you this time, Commissioner McDowell. Uh, Representative Greg Walden, uh, Republican of Oregon, uh, Subcommittee Chair for Internet and Telecommunications, recently said on this program, quote, that the FCC recently has been more concerned with expanding its thor authority rather than working with Congress to embed better processes. Well, uh, Certainly in those cases where I've dissented, I agree with the chairman. <laughs> uh, and um, so uh, I do think there are times when the FCC has reached beyond its authority. Um, and uh, I've written strong and clear dissents on that. Sometimes I win at the appellate level, sometimes I lose the appellate. And I think I owe you a steak dinner or two for the times <laughs> I've lost. But how come you don't know me for any times you've lost? But anyway. Um, I, I, was, I wasn't going to mention that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll have to make some bets off camera. But... Um, 
You know, I think this also does speak, though, to the need for a, a legislative rewrite. I mean, we really do need to look beyond these stovepipes. The, the marketplace has moved uh, past uh, these creaky old laws that were written in a monopoly analog world. Uh, comprehensive so rewrite? Comprehensive rewrite. Really, I think, based on, you didn't ask, but uh, on competition law. So is there a concentration of consumer, uh, of concentration of market power, abuse of that power that results in consumer harm? Uh, and that really is the, the way to approach uh, a lot of this. Chairman Janikowski. You know, the, uh, um, the world isn't slowing down and waiting for debates about authority to get resolved. And for the U.S. to lead the world in broadband, uh, to continue to ensure that there's a framework for innovation, competition, et cetera, it has to do its work. And that's what the agency did over the last four years, as Rob mentioned, on a very long list of things we agreed on, on some issues we disagreed on. Uh, but the agency woke up every day and did the work that was necessary to help fuel the broadband economy. So transforming the Universal Service Fund. Some people argued uh, that the commission didn't have the authority to do that. Uh, it's being challenged in court. Rob and I agreed that we did. The commission moved forward. Uh, broadband data roaming, uh, very important to promote competition in the mobile market. Rob and I disagreed on that one. Um, uh, 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 the FCC won in court uh, on a challenge against its authority. You could have said I lost. That's <laughs> you know, on open internet, uh, this debate is going on. It's fine to have these debates about authority. Um, uh, well, I don't disagree that Congress should look at modernizing the statute, but I think it would be a mistake for the U.S. Uh, economy, a mistake for our global competitiveness, for the FCC to slow down. I'm convinced that the agency has the authority that it needs to address uh, uh, issues uh, around promoting our broadband economy going forward, driving investment, driving innovation, promoting competition, and protecting consumers. Did you feel like Congress was your partner when you served as chairman? I, I, I did, almost all the time. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the transformation of the Universal Service Fund, the elimination of intercarrier compensation was a good example. Uh, it's an example of how uh, bipartisan um, Things can get done in Washington. Uh, uh, I'm really proud of the work that Rob and I and the rest of the commissioners did together at the commission on it. And we worked very well with Congress, both Democrats and Republicans, uh, in a good back and forth dialogue to get that done. I, I, I think our relationship with Congress was a very healthy one. We didn't agree on everything, but the debates uh, were, uh, were on the merits. And uh, listen, in our system, debate argumentation uh, is good. Uh, it leads to a better result, uh, leads to better analysis, better outcomes. And, and let me just say one thing real quickly about uh, bipartisanship, which is, you know, under uh, Julius's leadership at the commission, if you disagreed with him, he didn't hold a grudge. Uh, we moved on to the next item, uh, and that's the way it should be, and uh, that's the way a democracy should work. The universal service intercarry compensation item, that was the first federal entitlement reform since 1996 welfare reform, which was also bipartisan, by the way. Um, and that was with a three-to-one partisan divide. It was the one Republican and three Democrats, and we were able to do that and put uh, spending controls. It didn't go as far as I would have liked, but uh, it was a big constructive step. Um, and that would only happen uh, with uh, four commissioners, with a chairman who was willing to take some risks. And uh, we all took a risk, and it was for the better, and I would hope Congress would take a look at that and try to emulate that. Time for one more question, Lynn Stan. Um, the, since you both left, the FCC adopted an order that you had been circulating before you left on support for broadband deployment under the Universal Service Program, um, and they're offering even more money than you reportedly had suggested that they do. Carriers had left $185 on the table last year when the FCC first million. proffered, excuse me, <laughs> $95 million on the table last year when the FCC first made this uh, offer. Do you think that there are some tweaks now where they can use it to, to um, roll out in areas that have very minimal uh, high speed or low speed internet, if you want to call it that? Um, do you think that more of that money is going to be accepted now under this order? Will it make a difference in the areas of the country that are underserved or unserved? I, I, I do think more of it will be accepted. And, um, and I think the amount that was accepted the first time was a good outcome. You know, one of the things that together, working together, we tried to achieve was uh, to make sure that we were spending under the new Connect America Fund the right amount of money to maximize the bang for the buck, uh, to make sure that we weren't spending a dollar more than we needed to to drive broadband build out to unserved areas. And so a 50% take rate on the first tranche what it said to me was, we got that about right. 
we're not overspending here. And what the commission is doing now is uh, it's taking a look at what happened in the first tranche. Uh, and based on that, it's moving quickly, very quickly now to a second tranche. And because of this process, I think we can feel confident that the people's money is being well spent to accomplish the objective of the program, which is to get broadband rolled out to areas that don't have it. Anything to add to that, Commissioner? No, you know, uh, actually, uh, having $185 million <clears throat> left on the table, that's a big table, by the way, in my view, um, but I do think that shows uh, some efficiencies that were adopted, that that's, those are the fruits of the efficiencies. Uh, going forward and uh, repurposing it and uh, putting in cost savings, I think, uh, is something that should be emulated for other federal programs. And let's close with a question from Eliza Krigman, uh, who's now an independent telecom reporter, worked for Politico for a long time. What is your greatest accomplishment during your tenure at the FCC and your greatest regret? Yeah. Um, I'm happy to go first. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I, I'm proud that we got the agency focused on broadband and focused on driving uh, ubiquitous wired and wireless broadband everywhere, and that uh, working together, uh, usually agreeing, sometimes disagreeing, we got some big things done to drive that forward. Uh, the transformation of the Universal Service Fund, uh, moving uh, incentive auctions from IDEA to law to FCC proposal, um, uh, big steps to promote competition. We're seeing a much healthier mobile market today than we were a few years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, in, in my view, uh, putting the first rules on the books to preserve internet openness and internet freedom. And uh, what would you like to have been able to do? I would have liked um, another 24 hours in the day and another seven days in the week. Uh, because uh, working around the clock, as we all did and as the staff did, uh, there's just not enough time to tackle all the important, wonderful, complex, difficult mm -hmm. issues uh, that are required now by the broadband economy, by the changes in technology, and by the global nature of the competition. We're in a global bandwidth race, and around the world, other countries are waking up every day and saying, we want the investment and the innovation here. So uh, I, I wish we had more time. So I think in terms of accomplishments, it would be more thematic, which is trying to make the case for uh, following the law and the facts, not being too imaginative in uh, your interpretation of the law. Uh, trusting and being patient with markets. Uh, sometimes markets will are underway uh, fixing uh, perceived problems. Uh, being wary of uh, the unintended costs and consequences of new rules. Um, biggest regrets would be uh, not being able to uh, pare back some more unnecessary rules um, and uh, whatever votes I may have lost on appeal. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, please come back. Sorry we're out of time. Robert McDowell, former lead Republican on the FCC, currently with the Hudson Institute. Julius Janikowski, former chairman of the FCC, now with the Aspen Institute, and Lynn Stanton with Telecommunications Reports. Thank you. C-SPAN.